All right, well, welcome back. Uh, last time we finished chapter 12, so we finished the brain and essentially the central nervous system. So we'll move on to the peripheral nervous system this time. So hopefully this video doesn't find you going too stir crazy. All right, so I'm gonna start with scenario as we would do if we were in class. And the scenario is, I want you to pretend that you're a football coach. So you're watching a game and one of your players comes off of the field, and as they're coming off of the field, they're in obvious pain, they look concerned, uh, and their arm is just kind of hanging by their side, it's just dangling there. And they tell you that their arm is stinging, it's burning, and they can't move it. And so one of the things that you would do for this very concerned player is you'd want to ask them a number of questions. Obviously, you want to start with what happened. And so one of the things that they're going to tell you is that we're going to pretend they're a defensive player. So they're going to tell you that their head got knocked to the side. And so they were kind of like Bruce Smith here on the bottom where their head got knocked into, that's referred to as lateral flexion. So their head got knocked to the side. And as soon as that happened, they just felt like their arm went dead and started burning like it was on fire and then they couldn't move it. So one of the things to think about is, you know, what might be going on here? Well, it's probably not a muscular injury because that tends to be more of like a sharp stabbing kind of pain. And that also wouldn't necessarily be consistent with that, that burning sensation. So probably not a muscular injury, probably not a shoulder dislocation because they didn't tell you they heard and felt a pop and couldn't move it. Although that is possible and we'll talk about why a shoulder dislocation is possible here in a second. But the fact that they have, their, their two basic symptoms are that they've got tingling and burning, which is referred to as paresthesia. And then they've got a loss of ability to move the arm, which is paralysis, right? So they got paresthesia, paralysis. So what's happening here is there's something affecting the nervous system, right? Um, but in this case, it's only affecting one arm, not both. So it's probably not affecting the central nervous system. It's not probably affecting the brain or spinal cord, because if you have an injury to the spinal cord, then that tends to produce symptoms bilaterally or on both sides. In this case, our symptoms are unilateral. They're one-sided. So I would suspect that there's some sort of a, a peripheral nerve injury. And so the particular condition that I'm describing to you here is called a stinger or a burner colloquially, but it is more technically a brachial plexus neuropraxia is what it's actually uh, referred to as. And so the brachial plexus, you can see the picture of it here, it is this bundle of nerves that starts at the fifth cervical vertebrae, so it runs from C5 down to the first thoracic vertebrae down to T1. And so those bundle or that bundle of nerves innervates your arm. And so effectively what has happened here is when you get your head knocked to the side as Bruce Smith, Bruce Smith has done there, then you stretch out those nerves. And so then when you stretch out the nerves, it's very similar to what we talked about with a concussion. So remember with a concussion, one of the things that produces symptoms is if you accelerate or decelerate the head, you stretch out the axon of those neurons and that inhibits their ability to maintain those electrical electrochemical gradients it inhibits their ability to keep potassium inside and to keep calcium out because of that physical deformation so a very similar thing is happening here because this player's head got knocked to the side it stretched out the nerves going into their arm and so because of that they can't maintain their electrochemical gradient and so the sensory nerves are depolarizing when they shouldn't and so then the brain interprets that noise if you will as tingling, or they may have some numbness as well. So that's just a lack of, of signaling. And then the fact that because that uh, the, the motor neurons, because their axons are stretched, they can't get signals out from the spinal cord out to the muscles you want to contract. And so because of that, that's what causes the paralysis. So the damage to the motor neurons then is what keeps them from moving. The damage to the sensory neurons is what then keeps them from feeling or causes that burning sensation. So this is a pretty common injury in football players. Again, you know, if they get their head knocked around some. So for example, you'll see players sometimes, like one of the Cowboys linebackers has a big, kind of looks like a satellite dish on the back of his shoulder pads. And so his particular one is referred to as a cowboy collar, but the idea behind those is to limit head and neck movement to prevent injuries like this. Because again, these are fairly common. You'll see sometimes the football players will have big neck rolls around their shoulder pads to keep their head from moving around too much. So a relatively common injury in contact sports, and it's an injury of the peripheral nervous system. So remember that the central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system is everything 
outside of the spinal cord. So we'll, we'll talk about nerve roots here in a second. There are dorsal and ventral roots, and then those converge to make spinal nerves. So starting at those dorsal and ventral roots, that's our peripheral nervous system. But you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, we talked about the brain, we didn't talk about the spinal cord, and you just said spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, and you are correct. So we should probably talk about the spinal cord. So the, the basic job of the spinal cord is to relay signals away from the brain, in the case of motor output, or relay signals back to the brain in the case of sensory information. So if we look at the spinal cord in cross-section, as we've done a couple times in class, you'll notice that the spinal cord has white and gray matter. So we've talked about the differences between those two. So remember that white matter, and in the case of the spinal cord, all of this outer area, that's your white matter. And then gray matter kind of makes an H sort of a shape here in the middle of the spinal cord. So the difference between the two is that your white matter is tracts, and remember that's T-R-A-C-T-S, tracts, which are bundles of axons that are going up or down the cord, or relaying information, if you will, up or down the cord. So the white matter are bundles of axons, and again, the reason for the color is because they're myelinated, remember that myelination is an insulation for the axon that helps it send its electrical signal faster, but that myelination consists of fat whether it's the oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system or the uh, Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. Either way, that insulation is fat, which then gives that tissue that white appearance. So the white matter is myelinated axons, and those bundles, again, they're called tracts. The gray matter, then, is unmyelinated tissue, and it's primarily cell bodies, and it also includes interneurons, which we'll talk about here in a second. So because it's unmyelinated, then that's what gives it sort of that gray appearance. It's basically due to the lack of fat. So coming off of the cord, you'll see we have our dorsal root back here. So remember that dorsal, we talked about the dorsal fin being on a dolphin, so it's in the back. So the dorsal root is back here. The ventral root is up here. So an important thing to know is that the dorsal roots carry afferent or sensory information. So your sensory information comes in the back side of the spinal cord, and then the motor information exits through the front. Both of those two roots converge, and then we get our spinal nerve starting here. So the spinal nerve includes both sensory and motor fibers, which is why if you damage those nerves of the brachial plexus, those nerves are all going to contain both sensory and motor fibers. So if you get some sort of damage to them, you're going to have sensory symptoms, that paresthesia, but you're also going to have motor symptoms, which is the paralysis. So if you had some sort of damage to the ventral root, that would impair motor function. If you had damage then to the dorsal root, obviously you'd have problems with sensory function. In the case of interneurons, what those are, and I'll actually click back, so there aren't any pictures, but there will be some on future slides, but interneurons, so obviously inter means between, and so interneurons sit between neurons. And so they may relay information from an afferent neuron to an efferent, so from a sensory to a motor neuron, or they may relay information to um, other clusters of neurons. So what we're gonna talk about interneurons is primarily in their role in reflex activity. So interneurons, for our purposes, are gonna sit between sensory and motor neurons. And then the last thing on there, the meninges. So if you have the original printout, that's not on there. I added that today. So the meninges, remember what we talked about in the central nervous system, the, the layers of covering of the brain. So there's the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. They're basically the same in the spinal cord, because again, the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. The primary difference between the brain and the spinal cord as far as the meninges go is that the dura mater doesn't have a periosteal layer. So remember that in the brain, there's a periosteal layer to the dura mater that is basically the, the inner covering of the skull. And then you have a deeper layer that is closer to the brain of the dura mater. And the dura mater is the toughest of the three. So from superficial to deep then, they go dura mater, arachnoid mater, and then pia mater. So in that space underneath the arachnoid mater, that's where the cerebrospinal fluid is, because again, as part of the central nervous system, the spinal cord is also going to be bathed in cerebrospinal fluid. But because there's no periosteal layer on the dura mater, 
there's actually a space between the uh, bone of the vertebrae itself and then the dura mater. So that's what's referred to as the epidural space. So to orient you to, to what you're looking at here, this is a transverse or horizontal plane cut. Down here at the bottom, that's the anterior part of the vertebrae. And then up here at the top is the posterior part of the vertebrae. I know we haven't done vertebral anatomy yet, um, but basically with your vertebrae, you're gonna have a, a posterior projection here that's called the spinous process. Those are the bumps that you can feel along your spine. Those are your spinous processes. And then anteriorly, so here is your uh, intervertebral disc is what's being pictured here. And so basically you've got this uh, bony arch here, the neural arch that surrounds and protects the spinal cord. So obviously this is the spinal cord itself. And then we've got that bony protection for it. And then you've got, again, here, dorsal root, ventral root, those two come together and there's our spinal nerve. And so those nerves actually exit between vertebrae. And we'll talk about that more here in a second. So the nerves exit there between the vertebrae. So back to the epidural space, you might be familiar with the term epidural. So we talked about an epidural hematoma with the central nervous system or with the brain anyway, because we're still talking about the central nervous system here. So we talked about an epidural hematoma, but you might be familiar with an epidural as um, something that's used to relieve pain during childbirth. So one of the things that can be done to relieve pain during childbirth, and you can use epidurals for other things, but basically what they'll do is inject a local anesthetic here between the vertebrae into that epidural space. And what that local anesthetic does is it inhibits the voltage-gated sodium channels on these dorsal roots. But more specifically, think back to when we talked about those first order afferents. So when I'm talking about that, I'm referring to, there was a slide that showed A alphas, A betas, A deltas, and Cs, those first order afferents. So remember, first order afferents are gonna bring information from the body back to the spinal cord. So there, that information is gonna travel up these dorsal roots and then back to the posterior portion of the spinal cord. So, um, when you administer that local anesthetic there, it's going to inhibit the voltage-gated sodium channels on the smaller of those neurons. So remember the A-alphas are the biggest, they give us information about uh, proprioception, about movement. Uh, the A-betas give us information about touch, but then the A-deltas and the Cs are our pain fibers, and so those are the, the smallest of, of the four fibers are the A-deltas and the Cs. And so because they're smaller axons, those are particularly affected or particularly susceptible to that anesthetic. And so effectively then, the anesthetic inhibits those voltage-gated sodium channels on the, the A-deltas and the C fibers and keeps that, that action potential from reaching the spinal cord. And so if that pain information can't reach the cord, well, then it can't travel up the cord to the brain where we perceive it. But interestingly, one of the things that you're going to get if, in a woman who, who has an epidural is that she'll still be able to feel things like deep pressure and touch because, again, those are going to travel over the A-alphas and the A-betas. So she'll still have some sensory information coming up the cord, but it's just going to block the information coming from those smaller axons, which happen to be the pain neurons. So that's how epidurals work. And it's, they're used for things other than childbirth, but that's just the most common association that people tend to have with epidurals. All right, so I mentioned tracts before, and again, you can see the spelling, not spelled like a tract you run around, but tract with a T-R-A-C-T. So if something is an ascending tract, if something's ascending, it goes up, up the cord to the brain, right? So your ascending tracts then are your sensory tracts. So they're gonna bring sensory information from the body up the cord back to the brain so that the brain can interpret that information. And so again, a tract is a bundle of axons. So we talked about first, second, and third order afferents. So remember, and we just actually just talked about those on the last slide. Remember that the first order afferents in general, well, actually first order afferents always bring information from the body back to the spinal cord. Now what happens next varies a little bit. Either that information will actually travel up the cord to the brain stem, and then at that point, it'll move to a second neuron, and then that neuron will really relay the information from the brain stem up to the thalamus, and then you have a third neuron that relays the information from the thalamus 
to the primary somatosensory cortex. So those are your first, second, and third order neurons. So your first order neurons bring information from the body back to the spinal cord and potentially all the way back up to the brainstem. And then the second order relays it from the brainstem to the thalamus and then third order from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory cortex. And remember in the somatosensory cortex, that's where you have the, the map of your body that is kind of upside down and it has the, the different proportions. So there's a really big area for the face, really small area for your shin, for example. So that area of the brain is where we localize, you know, where something is specifically touching me. And then in, in the other cases, as you'll see here in a second, you have a first order afferent brings that information, brings that sensory information back to the cord. Second order information will bring it up the cord. And some of those actually just then detour into the cerebellum which again we use to, or the cerebellum, its role is to sort of fine tune motor skills. So in terms of the ascending tracks, you can see there on the left, any of the tracks in blue, those are your ascending tracks, those are the ones that bring sensory information. So we'll start here, and basically the way they're paired, the dorsal white column and the spinothalamic tracks are tracks that relay conscious sensory information. So sensory information that you're aware of. So the dorsal column, relays information about discriminative touch. So if something is touching me, is it one or two points? Is it a fairly light kind of a touch? It, where exactly is it? You know, discriminating where on my hand something is touching me, that kind of stuff. So that information travels up the dorsal white column as does vibration information. And then the bottom one, the spinothalamic tract, so spinothalamic, spine and thalamus, that particular track or those tracks relay information about pain, temperature, and coarse touch. So again, those two are gonna relay information about, or relay conscious sensory information. So the combination of the dorsal white column and the spinothalamic tracks give us conscious sensory information. As opposed to the one in the middle there, the spinocerebellar tracks, so if it's spinocerebellar, obviously those neurons are gonna synapse in the cerebellum and so those are going to give me unconscious sensory information. So they'll tell me about, is a muscle stretched or not? If so, how much? So they'll also, um, based on that information, help me coordinate muscle activity. So there's no contribution to conscious sensory information there with those ascending tracks. So the next picture is kind of a schematic of how all of that works. So on the right side, we'll start there. So what you're looking at here are different... Uh, different sections of either the brain or spinal cord. And I'm gonna pause for one second and I'll come right back. All right, sorry about that with this whole working from home thing. I'm also uh, teaching a fourth grader. So at any rate, with the ascending tracks. So one of the things you've got here in terms of what you're looking at, so you've got, this is a frontal plane cut of the brain. And so your somatosensory cortex is what's being depicted here. So this is the, the primary somatosensory cortex. And then all of these other cuts are transverse or horizontal plane cuts. So that, that makes things a little bit difficult. Um, but effectively what you've got, so you've got um, receptors in the skin. So Meissner's corpuscles that are responsible for if there's light touch in the skin, that will cause them to um, that, that mechanical deformation will cause them to generate an action potential in, in that case, a first order afferent that is an A beta. And so then that depolarization, that action potential will travel up through the foot, up the leg, all the way back in this um, ventral, sorry, <laughs> dorsal root here, dorsal root, will travel all the way back in the dorsal root, and then it'll go into, so then it merges with the other axons from a similar area. So they'll merge together into that track. So that's that dorsal column. It'll travel all the way up the spinal cord and then synapse here in the medulla. So again, in the brainstem. So that's our first order afferent is bringing the information from that receptor in my foot all the way back to the cord and up the cord up to the brain. So as you can tell, that's a pretty long cell um, with a fairly long axon. So we we'll relay that cord or that signal, sorry, up the brain into the brainstem, and then we'll transmit that signal from this first order afferent to the second, which then brings the information from the brainstem all the way up to the thalamus, and then we'll transmit that information from that second order afferent 
to the third order, which brings it from the thalamus to that primary somatosensory cortex that lets me know exactly where something is touching me. And then the other one here with the uh, joint receptor, similar kind of a thing, it's just higher up in the cord because the higher section of your cord, so the thoracic section and the lower cervical section of the cord are responsible for sensory information from the arm and hand. And so if we move my thumb, there are proprioceptors in this case in the joint capsule that are going to generate an action potential that then travels back up to the cord, up to the brain stem, and then we relay that information again from that first order of ferrant to the second order, to the thalamus, and then over to the primary somatosensory cortex. As opposed to, remember, so the spinocerebellar pathway gives us information about proprioception, particularly as it pertains to the muscles. So are the muscles stretched or not? If so, how fast are they stretching? That kind of information is bundled into the spinocerebellar pathway. And then, so the first order ferrant runs from the particular muscle that's being stretched all the way over here in the back side of the spinal cord to our second order of ferrant here, which then brings it back to the cerebellum. So there's actually only two neurons involved in that process. If the information being transmitted had been pain information rather than just something is touching me information, remember that, going back a slide, maybe. Let's see if it'll let me do that. There we go. All right, so remember that going back a slide, so the spinothalamic tracts are the ones that carry information about pain and coarse touch. So something is touching me but really hard, so things like foam rolling um, that, that tend to be pretty uncomfortable, that information, that deeper touch, is going to is going to travel over these spinothalamic tracts. So if the information being transmitted had been some sort of a deeper touch or some sort of a painful sensation, this axon would actually be bundled into a tract kind of over here in more of the anterior aspect of the cord, which so you can see you got kind of anterolateral aspect there. Actually, we'll go on this side where they're labeled. So you have the anterolateral aspect here and then the anterior aspect there. So pain information would travel up a slightly different section of the cord, more of this anterolateral or anterior section, and it would go to the same place, to the medulla, and then on up to the primary somatosensory cortex after stopping in the thalamus. So those are your ascending tracks, again, bringing sensory information up the cord, back to the brain, so the brain can make meaning of that information. If ascending tracks carry sensory information, obviously descending tracks carry motor information. So if something is descending, it's going down. So in this case, we're sending information down from the brain and out to the body. So there are a couple of different sets of terminology for this. Um, I probably should update my terminology. The original uh, terminology that I learned and that's, that's uh, still uh, partially in this book is pyramidal versus extrapyramidal tracks. So the pyramidal tracts control voluntary muscle contraction. So whenever you uh, contract your biceps, for example, that information comes down from that primary motor cortex in the brain all the way down to the um, C6 spinal level, and then that'll stimulate the contraction of the biceps. So basically the way it works is that, or let's view this another way, the pyramidal tracks, their alternative name is the direct pathways. And so what happens there is that, remember if you're doing voluntary muscle contraction, that the neurons that initiate that signal are in that primary motor cortex. And remember that those neurons are called pyramidal cells. And they have really long axons. So they run from that primary motor cortex, their axon runs all the way down um, through the brain stem and it runs down to the particular spinal level of the muscle that you want to contract. Of When I say the particular spinal level, uh, where the alpha motor neurons sit for that particular muscle that you want to activate. So the pyramidal tracks then, again, carry voluntary motor information originating in the primary motor cortex, traveling all the way down the cord to whichever particular um, motor units or muscles you want to activate. The extrapyramidal tracks then, on the other hand, so they, sorry, back up just a little bit. So there's a direct connection. So the direct connection runs from the brain, from that uh, pyramidal cell in that primary motor cortex, all the way down to the alpha motor neuron, and there's a direct one-to-one -one connection. And then once that alpha motor neuron is stimulated, it sends an action potential out to the particular muscle cells that it's contracted to, or sorry, that it's connected to, and then they will contract as opposed to the extrapyramidal tracts. 
So those are a little bit more complex, which is why they're, they're referred to as indirect pathways. So they synapse with numerous interneurons, and there's not just a direct one-to-one -one, uh, connection between those tracks and a particular alpha motor neuron. So because there's that, um, that interconnection between them, that's where the indirect pathways comes in. So the thing to know about the extrapyramidal tract or the extrapyramidal uh, pathways, or sorry, the indirect pathways, the thing to know about them, so those are going to control primarily involuntary or postural muscle contraction. So the extrapyramidal tracts um, largely originate in the brainstem, and they will control contraction of the spinal erectors, for example, the muscles that, that hold your head up, the muscles that hold your chest up, um, that stabilize your spine, basically. Um, and in addition to those, they'll also control uh, the muscles involved in head, neck, and eye movement. So whenever you, you follow something, you know, that's moving across your eye field, extra pyramidal, information traveling over the extra pyramidal tracks is what's going to stimulate that muscle contraction. So the short, short version then is that your pyramidal tracks, which include these two, the corticospinal and the rubrospinal, so the top two are your pyramidal tracks, that's voluntary movement or motor information. And then these bottom three, starting at the reticulospinal, down to the vestibulospinal, and then the tectospinal, those are your extrapyramidal tracts or indirect pathways. So again, similar graphic to the one that we looked at a second ago, now we're just going down instead of up. So let's say that I want to flex my right hip. Well then, remember that the motor neuron that's going to be, or the pyramidal cell, I should say, the pyramidal cell that's going to be involved in that is going to be on the opposite side of the brain. So if I want to get hip flexion on the right side, the pyramidal cell that's going to be responsible for initiating that contraction is going to be on the left side of the brain. So my pyramidal cell up here is going to depolarize. It's going to send an action potential down through the brain, all the way down through the brain stem, and then it's going to switch sides. So remember that decussation of the pyramids, or switching sides of those axons of those pyramidal tracts happens in the medulla oblongata. So it's going to switch sides from the left to the right. Now it's going to go down those voluntary, so those pyramidal tracts, going to go down the cord to that particular level. So in the, in the case of the hip flexors, that's L1. So now we're at the L1 uh, spinal level. So it'll synapse with an interneuron. So that's an interneuron there, that little pink thing. And then that will initiate depolarization of this alpha motor neuron. And so once the alpha motor neuron depolarizes, go back a slide, there we go. Once the alpha motor neuron depolarizes, we'll generate an action potential that goes all the way out to the muscle cell or muscle cells that it's attached to. And then all the stuff that we've talked about previously happens. So then you get the release of acetylcholine, opening of the chemically gated channels, opening of the voltage gated channels, release of calcium, all that stuff. So that's where all of that fits. So the other thing I have on my slide is upper versus lower motor neurons. So the upper motor neurons, both of these are upper motor neurons. So they're ones that originate in that primary motor cortex, or in the case of the extrapyramidal tracts, they can originate in the brainstem. But either way, the upper motor neurons originate uh, essentially in the, the brain and the brain stem. And then the lower motor neurons, their cell bodies sit in what are referred to as the anterior horns of the spinal cord. So thinking back to what we talked about in terms of the gray matter versus the white matter, so you've got your H of gray matter here. So you have anterior horns, there's two of those. And then you've got your posterior horns, there's two of those. And then there are also lateral horns in the thoracic section. But for us, the anterior and the posterior horns are going to be the more important ones. So in the anterior horns of the spinal cord then, again, that's where your alpha motor neurons sit. So starting in the anterior horns of the spinal cord, those are your lower motor neurons. So all of your alpha motor neurons that sit in there, those are lower motor neurons. All right. So <clears throat> other stuff with the perif peripheral nervous system. So again, the peripheral nervous system, uh, what it's going to do is bring information from the body back to the cord or away from the cord and out to the body. So in terms of part one and part two, that's information that originates there in sensory receptors. That may be information about uh, movement. 
So about deformation of a joint capsule, about stretching of a muscle, about uh, something is burning me, that kind of sensory information. That'll travel again, that those sensory receptors will stimulate or generate an action potential in any of those first order afferents that we talked about. And then those first order afferents are the transmission lines. They bring that information back to the spinal cord. And then if we're going out, starting at those alpha motor neurons, we're gonna bring information away from the spinal cord and then cause muscle contraction, which may be a part of a reflex loop that we'll talk about here in a second. All right, so our spinal nerves, again, so there's a dorsal root back here, which carries sensory information, ventral root up here, those two merge and those make our spinal nerves. And you've got 31 pairs of those, so those pairs, you've got one on the right side, one on the left side, and again, 31 pairs of those that exit the spinal cord. And then you've also got 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So the cranial nerves either originate from the forebrain, and there are only a few of those, most of them attach at the brain stem. So the cranial nerves can either be uh, all sensory, all motor, or both. So the cranial nerves include things like the olfactory nerve, uh, optic, oculomotor, trochlear, trigeminal, abducens, facial. I'm not reading those. If, if you go to uh, graduate school for uh, athletic training, physical therapy, probably most types of medicine, you'll have to memorize the cranial nerves and what they do. And they're also part of a concussion evaluation. So if you've ever had a concussion or watched a concussion evaluation and you've seen the athletic trainer or the physician, whoever is doing it, ask the uh, injured athlete if they can um, follow a pen, for example, or if they can um, read certain information, or they'll ask them to make facial expressions, they'll ask them to stick out their tongue. There's a bunch of different things that they're doing or that they will do. So what they're doing is an evaluation of the cranial nerves, because sometimes with a traumatic brain injury, you can get damage to the brain stem um, which would then cause impairment of those cranial nerves. And so then they may have something um, where they have problems with their tongue movement or a pupil dilation, that kind of thing. So in terms of the cranial nerves, either being sensory or motor or both, um, there's one of them that is sensory only is the olfactory nerve. And so that brings uh, information about smell back to the brain, as opposed to the oculomotor, is motor only, as you'd expect from the name, and so it's responsible for pupil size, so pupil dilation or constriction. And then the facial nerve is one that does both, so the facial nerve is both involved in taste, but it's also involved in facial expression. So those are your cranial nerves. Like I said, if you go to grad school, you'll have to memorize them and what all they do, but for now we're talking about the spinal nerves, so a little bit farther down the cord. So in terms of the way the spinal nerves are named, so what you're looking at here is a dermatome map, and I'll explain why that guy has all the different colors on him here in a second. But let's start in the middle of this drawing. So we'll start here. So what all of these are, those are supposed to be vertebrae. And so remember that your vertebrae are your spine bones. This thing is the spinal cord. And then the little offshoots from the spinal cord, well, those are obviously then your spinal nerves. So remember that in the spine, you've got three sections to the spine. So there's the cervical section, which is your neck. So in this case, that's kind of that pinkish color. You've got the thoracic section, which is essentially your ribs. And that's the, sort of the purple color. And then you've got the lumbar section, which is your low back. And that's green. And then the sacral section, which is kind of that aqua color down here. So as mentioned, there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and so they project off of the spinal cord. In the case of the cervical section, they're named for the vertebrae that, they ru that runs underneath them. So the C1 spinal nerve actually runs on top of or above C1. This is the C2 spinal nerve, C3, C4. But one of the things that we run into that makes life a little bit confusing is that there are actually eight cervical spinal nerves but there's only seven cervical vertebrae. So your C8 spinal nerve is this one that runs underneath C7. And then the rest of it makes sense all the way down the rest of the, the vertebral column and the spinal cord because then all the spinal nerves are named for the vertebrae above them. So here's T1, and so here's the T1 spinal nerve, here's T2, the vertebral body, and then here's the T2 spinal nerve. 
And so what this drawing is, is a dermatome map. And a dermatome is an area of skin innervated by a particular spinal nerve. So if you have a problem with that spinal nerve, one of the symptoms of that uh, injury, let's say, is that you lose sensation in a particular area of skin. So a not uncommon injury or a not uncommon pathology for somebody to have is bone spurs, also called osteophytes, to be more scientific about it. Um, but those bone spurs will be um, projected laterally on the vertebral bodies or off of the vertebral bodies. And so that bony projection may actually press on that spinal nerve. And so if you have mechanical impingement of a spinal nerve, well, now you have basically a kink in the hose of information. So if we've got impairment, let's do a little more common one. So let's say somebody has a, a bone spur at the, let's go with um, C6 level. So with that then, so here's your little C6 spinal nerve right there. So if we've got an impairment there, then we're gonna get lack of information, lack of sensory information coming back to the cord because we have mechanical impingement. So if the information can't make it back to the cord, then it can't make it up to the brain for the brain to process. And potentially will also affect the outflow of motor information coming over that particular spinal nerve. So if somebody has a C6 uh, spinal nerve injury because they have a bone spur in their neck, then they're gonna lose sensation over here. So you can see C6 over here on the thumb. So all of this area of the forearm, all that sensory information travels back to the spinal cord via, and ultimately in, enters the spinal cord via the C6 spinal nerve. So if you have a problem with that C6 spinal nerve, well, you're not gonna be able to feel essentially the area on the lateral forearm and the area of uh, kind of over brachioradialis. You'll lose sensation there. So dermatomes again, areas of skin innervated by a particular nerve root. Another really common pathology related to dermatomes or where dermatomes might come up is in the case of disc herniation. So disc herniation, obviously I've changed the, the slide here, but what you're looking at is again a, a transverse or horizontal cut. And so you've got, again, that spinous process, the posterior part of the vertebrae here, and then you've got the anterior part of the vertebrae down here. This is the intervertebral disc. So the intervertebral disc has two parts. There's the annulus fibrosus, which is the more superficial part, and then the nucleus pulposus, which is this inner part. It's a very jelly-like material. So sometimes discs are referred to as being kind of like a jelly donut. So you've got that, that outer annulus that holds in that inner jelly-like material, the nucleus pulposus. So one of the things that can happen, and this is fairly common in the lumbar spine, so in the low back, is that people kind of sit with their back uh, rounded, so with your lumbar spine in flexion. And so when you do that, if you compress this anterior part of the disc, so if you compress this front part of the, the disc here, well then that pushes the disc posteriorly. And you would think it would go straight back onto the spinal cord, but it doesn't because there's actually a, a posterior longitudinal ligament here. So there's a ligament that protects the spinal cord itself, but that ligament ends kind of on either side of the spinal cord. So when the disc tries to bulge straight back, it can't because there's that reinforcing ligament. So instead, the disc bulges out to one side or the other. And when it does, then it presses on that spinal nerve. And so again, now you've got this kink in the hose of information. And so because of that, you're not getting sensory information back to the cord. So the brain doesn't perceive it, which oftentimes in the case of bulging disc injuries presents as numbness. Or you've got... I mean, yeah, let's go with or you've got a kink in the information of, of outflow of, of uh, motor information coming away from the cord that would cause muscle contraction. So if we back up here. So in the case of the lumbar spine, a really common bulging disc is between L4 and L5. And so what ends up happening as that disc bulges out, it actually most commonly affects the lower of those two. So then the L5 nerve root or sorry, not nerve root, spinal nerve in that case. So it affects the L5 spinal nerve. Somebody that has a bulging disc at L4, L5 would probably have loss of sensation across this lateral aspect of the shin and across the top of the foot. And similarly, they're probably gonna have some weakness, which then leads us to our next term on this slide, which is myotomes. So I don't have a map for myotomes, um, but what myotomes are, are groups of muscles innervated by a particular spinal nerve. 
So for example, in the case of the lumbar spine, the hip flexors are innervated by L1, the hip adductors are L2, knee extensors are L3, dorsiflexors L4, big toe L5, plantar flexion S1, and the knee flexion is S2. And so what ends up happening there, if somebody has my, uh, the injury that I presented there, so the L4, L5 disc herniation, again, they're gonna lose sensation kind of on that lateral aspect um, of their lower leg. And as you can see, that sensory information continues back here, so they may have some numbness or tingling kind of into the buttocks, which would be fairly common. They'll also, people talk about getting sciatica. So you can see S1 is here. So they may have kind of a tingling or loss of sensation on the back of their leg because another really commonly herniated disc is between L5, S1. So in addition to the loss of sensation, let's say back here along the buttocks or on the posterior thigh, one of the things that you would also notice if you tested is that they might have some weakness either picking up their big toe because that's L5 or they might have some weakness in plantar flexion, so pushing off, because that's S1. So you typically have that combination of both, kind of like we talked about with the stinger at the outset, or the burner at the outset, that you get some impairment of sensory function, which can present either as paresthesia, so that tingling sensation, or you can get um, numbness. Um, and then the other side of things is you get impairment of, uh, sorry, motor outflow. So, so then that presents as weakness. So dermatomes then, area of skin innervated by a particular spinal nerve. Myotomes are a group of muscles innervated by a particular spinal nerve. And again, with myotomes, you'll have to learn those if you go to grad school. There are different, uh, basically, dances to learn the myotomes. So the one for the brachial plexus is pretty fun. Um, but for example, where that would come up is if somebody had that brachial plexus injury that I talked about on that first slide, one of the things that you would do as part of your testing is you do both dermatome myotome testing. So you would actually see, make sure they've got sensation on both sides before you allow them to return to play, but also do strength testing on both sides. And so for example, um, the C5 spinal nerve is responsible for elbow flexion and shoulder or glenohumeral abduction. And so one of the things I would do on the sideline is say, okay, hold your arms out to the side and don't let me push you down. And if they're basically 80% as strong or stronger on the uninjured side, or sorry, on the injured side, um, along with some other muscle tests, I would probably let them go back to play. So that's the way that myotomes work. All right, so let's talk about sensory receptors. So obviously, as we've talked about with some other things, there, there are numerous different ways to classify them. You can classify them based on what kind of um, stimulus causes them to generate an action potential based on their location or their structural complexity, so they have, some are more or less complicated uh, in their structure. All right, so if we're looking at by type, so mechanoreceptors, if they are mechanically deformed, if they're compressed, that'll cause them to generate an action potential, as opposed to thermoreceptors. In the case of thermoreceptors, they are sensitive, obviously, to temperature. So if something is burning you or something's very cold, those are your thermoreceptors that sense that information. Photoreceptors are light receptors. Obviously, those are in the eye. Chemoreceptors, uh, we have numerous chemoreceptors uh, throughout the body. And so an example of a chemoreceptor, um, so you monitor the pressure, or partial pressure technically, of oxygen in the blood. You also monitor the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. And so that then regulates heart rate or plays a role in regulating heart rate, that plays a role in regulating breathing. So some of those chemoreceptors are in the carotid arteries, which are on either side of your neck. Those are your carotid arteries. So when you take your pulse during exercise, those are your carotid arteries. So you have chemoreceptors there that let you know about things like the, uh, the pH of the blood, the oxygen content, carbon dioxide content, that kind of stuff. And the nociceptors are your pain receptors. So those are primarily free nerve endings. So you can also classify your receptors based on location. So exteroceptors give us information about things external to the body. So if something is touching me, um, tickling me, if something is burning me, like burning my skin, that kind of stuff, uh, that information, those are your exteroceptors. And then interoceptors give us information about things inside of the body. So things like um, the partial pressure of oxygen or carbon dioxide that I just talked about a second ago, um, or distension of the stomach or the bladder or movement of muscles, that kind of stuff, all that in, uh, information that is transmitted by interoceptors. So 
and again, as you expect, so not to confuse you too much, um, if these are the same receptors, it's just a different way of thinking about them. So mechanoreceptors and enteroceptors and exteroceptors, there's crossover between them. So you've got mechanoreceptors that give us information about um, compression of the skin, or they give us information about, as I'm about to talk about here in a second, compression of a joint capsule. So your mechanoreceptors are also exteroceptors or enteroceptors as well. So there is obviously some crossover between them. So proprioceptors give us information about joint position, about where we are in space. So proprioception is awareness of your position in space. It's sometimes called position sense. Um, it's how some textbooks or some people will refer to it. So where you might have heard of proprioception, if you've seen people do exercise on unstable surfaces, the idea there is that they are getting better at getting feedback from their body about where their limb is in space. So if you do like squats on a BOSU, and the BOSU is that little half blue half dome thing with a black underside, if you do squats on that, obviously that's very different than doing it on a stable surface because you're going to get some you know, extension of the hip on one side versus flexion on the other, and then some ABA deduction, internal rotation, as you're moving around. And so the thought is, if you get used to causing those proprioceptors, those, those receptors responsible for position sense, to send lots of signals back to the cord, you'll be better aware of where your limb is in space, and then hopefully less likely to be injured. So in terms of um, the proprioceptors, we're going to start with the joint receptors. And so what you've got here in this picture is the right knee viewed from the medial aspect. And so what you're looking at here, so this is the medial collateral ligament or tibial collateral ligament here. And then you've got kind of this shadowy joint capsule here. So we're looking at, or what we would be looking at, is that outer layer of the joint capsule, that fibrous layer. And so in the joint capsule, you have receptors that are responsible for relaying information back to the brain about whether that part of the capsule is compressed or not. Um, and if, if there's a change in position, they're responsible for relaying how quickly that position change is taking place. So you can see there, um, there's two particular types of receptors that are important. So we've got our Pacinian corpuscles. And so those are not only in your joint capsules, but those are also in your ligaments and your tendons as well. And so what they do, or an important thing about them, is that they are referred to as rapidly adapting receptors. And so effectively what will happen then is, let's say, some of those Pacinian corpuscles on the posterior aspect of the knee joint capsule, if you flex your knee, let's say you just move your knee really slowly. So as you're slowly flexing the knee, those Pacinian corpuscles, those are mechanoreceptors, so as they're mechanically deformed, as there's compression of them with the flexion of the knee and the compression of the posterior part of the capsule, they'll start to generate action potentials. And so those action potentials will then travel back to the cord via those A-alphas, those first order afferents, and then up the cord to the brain stem, to the thalamus, and then to that primary somatosensory cortex. But the important part about them as rapidly adapting receptors is the faster you're changing positions, so the faster you're flexing the knee, the more action potentials they send per second. So if you're moving really slowly, so if you're slowly flexing the knee, slowly bending your leg, they're gonna send you know, maybe three action poten potentials per second, as opposed to if you're running full speed and you're really flexing the knee quickly, well then they may send 50 or more action potentials per second. And so an important thing to understand is just like on the motor side, if I want a really strong muscle contraction, the alpha motor neuron is gonna depolarize with a really high frequency, so like 80 pulses per second, if we want a really strong muscle contraction, versus if we want a lower level muscle contraction, it may be 20 times per second. The way that we code sensory information, the intensity of the stimulus is based on the frequency of depolarizations. So the faster we're moving, the more action potentials per second, the higher the frequency, those Pacinian corpuscles are gonna send back to the spinal cord. So those are our, our rapidly adapting receptors. As opposed to the Ruffini endings, so those are also in the joint capsules, and those are our slow adapting receptors. So you'd also have some Ruffini endings back here. And so those are gonna be sending action potentials effectively when you're not moving. So if you're just sitting there with your knees in flexion, you're gonna get some information from the Ruffini endings back to the cord and then up to the brain, 
that lets the brain know that the posterior part of the capsule is compressed and the anterior part is not. So essentially the Ruffini endings send action potentials when the joint is not moving, and then the Pacinian corpuscles send information when the joint is moving, and they code for how fast you're moving based on the number of, number of action potentials per second. So part of the way that you're aware of where your limb is in space is based on where you're getting signals and how frequently you're getting those signals. And so by that I mean action potentials. So at rest, you're constantly getting this feedback. So if you're, just not, if you're not even moving, you're getting constant feedback from the Ruffini endings, a couple of pulses per second or a couple of action potentials per second to let the brain know that one part of the capsule is compressed, another part is not. And so then the brain interprets that information to mean the joint is flexed or not so you know where your limbs are in space. But we get information not only from the joint capsules themselves or from the joints themselves, we also get information from the muscles. So our Golgi tendon organs, as you would expect, sit in the tendons. And the important thing to know, well, there's really two important things, but the first is that Golgi tendon organs are responsible for sensing tension in the muscle. So how hard is it pulling? How hard is it contracting? So um, what they do, one, one of the ways to think about them is kind of as, as being a governor on muscle contraction. So if you've ever moved and driven like a U-Haul truck, you know they have a governor on them where they can only go like 55 miles an hour. And then if you try to go faster than that, it basically shuts the engine down. So it causes the, the uh, truck to top out at 55 and then it decelerates or slows down after that point. So Golgi tendon organs serve a very similar function as a check on the intensity of muscle contraction. So if there's too much tension in the muscle, they send an inhibitory signal back to the spinal cord, which then synapses with an inner neuron, and that inner neuron then inhibits, this is an alpha motor neuron. So it inhibits, it, it makes more negative, it hyperpolarizes this alpha motor neuron, makes it harder for it to generate an action potential, and as a result then, those muscle cells relax. So if a Golgi tendon organ is stimulated, if there's too much tension in the muscle, it causes the alpha motor neuron to shut off, to stop sending action potentials. And so as a result then, again, all those muscle cells will relax. So that's what autogenic inhibition means. It's a relaxation of the muscle. Um, again, trying to limit the intensity of muscle contraction. Again, it's a safety break to keep the muscle from injuring itself. Because if we get too strong of a muscle contraction, we could get a strain, so we could damage the actual belly of the muscle, or we could damage the musculotendinous junction, or maybe even the muscle could pull off of the bone. So to prevent that, the Golgi tendon organs keep us from generating too strong of a muscle contraction. So where you see that, if you ever watch somebody like max out in the weight room, and they do, they're doing bench press. So sometimes you'll see this, if somebody has, you know, if they're truly maxing out on bench press, they'll bring the, weight, the bar down to their chest, they'll push it off of their chest, and they'll kind of get stuck in the middle, and they may hang out there for a second or two, and then it'll seem like they just all of a sudden relax, like the bar just drops. That's that Golgi tendon reflex. That's that, that uh, autogenic inhibition shutting off, in that case, the muscles uh, or the motor units in pec major and in the triceps, and so that causes that relaxation. You'd also see that if somebody's doing like plyometrics, if they're jumping off a box, and that box is too high, they kind of hit the ground, and then their muscles just relax and they fall down. Same kind of a thing, that's a Golgi tendon response, but in that case that would be in the quads or the hamstrings, causing them to hit the ground. So the thing to know about the, or things to know about the Golgi tendons, um, so they're responsible for muscle tension, and also that they cause an inhibitory reflex, they cause the muscle to relax. Because that's very different than the muscle spindles. So the muscle spindles, um, there's a couple different terms on there, or several different terms on there. So you've got extrafusal versus intrafusal fibers. Muscle spindles are also known as intrafusal fibers because they are inter, intermixed, they're inside of the muscle between all the normal muscle cells or muscle fibers we've been talking about. The extrafusal fibers, those are all the normal muscle fibers or muscle cells that we've been talking about. So intrafusal fibers are muscle spindles. Extrafusal fibers are all your normal muscle cells. The muscle spindles have two types, there's two types of them. Um, there's bag fibers and they're chain fibers. So the, the bag fibers are these that have the really big midsections to them. And then the chain fibers, well, before I move on from the, the bags, so these little things are nuclei. So the bag 
Uh, you got a bunch of nuclei clustered together, which is what causes that bulge in the midsection. As opposed to, in the chain fibers, all the nuclei are lined up end to end. And so with that, um, that makes for a thinner fiber. So there's a little bit of difference between the bag and the chain fibers, what they sense. Um, the chain fibers primarily sense static position. So if you're not moving, how much is a muscle stretched or not? The chain fibers relay that, that information primarily. There's a little bit of crossover, as we'll talk about here in a second. And then the bag fibers are more res responsive to changes in position and how fast. So if you will, skip back a slide, two slides. So remember that the Pacinian corpuscles are your rapidly adapting receptors in the joint. Those are pretty similar to the bag fibers as far as the muscle spindle goes. And then the Ruffini endings give us information about static or unchanging position. It's pretty similar to the chain fibers. Now again, there's some crossover because there's also two types of afferents that bring information away from these uh, muscle spindles. So you've got the type 1As, or the, the uh, yeah, we'll stick with that. So the 1A afferents. So those, as you'll see, are clustered around the midsection of the muscle spindles, and those are on both the bag and the chain fibers. Again, those are thought to relay information about change while it happens, and that the, the more uh, quickly that change is happening, the more action potentials per second they generate. As opposed to the type 2s are up here around this contractile end, and those give information about static position. So we've talked quite a bit about alpha motor neurons and about how those control voluntary muscle contraction. I'm going to throw another type of, mo of motor neuron at you here, which are the gamma motor neurons. So in our muscle here, so all of these would be our normal muscle cells, our extrafusal fibers. And then, so here's our muscle spindles, so there's our intrafusal fibers. And what you'll see there is there are contractile ends on either end of those muscle spindles. And so those are stimulated by gamma motor neurons. So what the gamma motor neurons do is they cause these contractile ends to either contract or not. And, and essentially what happens there is that allows, so if you shorten a muscle, if we weren't able to contract the ends of this muscle spindle, it would basically, it would be slack and it would not be very sensitive. You know, so if you, if you flex your elbow and you contract your biceps, if we didn't have these contractile ends that are attached to the gamma motor neurons and we weren't able to contract those, we would be less sensitive to changes in muscle length when the muscle was shortened. We'd be really sensitive when the muscle is lengthened, but not so much when the muscle is shortened. So effectively what the gamma motor neurons do is they stimulate these contractile ends of the muscle spindles to contract so that we can keep the muscle spindles at the same basic length as the rest of the fiber so that they maintain their sensitivity to uh, changes in length no matter what the length of the muscle is. Whether it's short or long, the muscle spindles are always pretty equally uh, sensitive. And we can actually make the muscle spindles hypersensitive to changes in position. Um, and so, for example, what ends up happening if you're in an unstable environment, so if you're doing squats on a BOSU, or if you are uh, on a city bus that's, you know, hitting bumps and changing direction, you know, turning really quickly, that kind of thing. So if you're in that sort of an unstable environment and you need to be able to react to a change in position really fast, you can stimulate those contractile ends of the muscle spindles so that the muscle spindle is already a little bit stretched out. So it's really sensitive then to any change in position. That's called gamma bias. And so we, we use gamma bias again when we're in any sort of an unstable environment. So we're, we're much more acutely aware of much smaller changes in position. As opposed to if I'm in a stable environment, I don't really need to be that aware of my change in position. And so you don't get that, that uh, over contraction, over stretching of those muscle spindles. All right, so let's talk about reflex arc. So one of the things I haven't mentioned yet with muscle spindles is that when they are stimulated, they cause a reflex contraction of the muscle. So if we stretch a muscle too quickly, then that stimulates the muscle spindle to send an afferent signal up to the spinal cord, and then the response at the spinal cord level is to stimulate an alpha motor neuron, which then causes reflex muscle contraction. So when we say reflex, we mean the signal doesn't have to reach the brain before we get an output. So you reflexively, you know, if you burn yourself, you touch a hot stove, something like that, you reflexively pull away. So you'll actually pull away before the brain perceives that you touch something hot. 
So again, in, in the case of reflexes, that happens without the brain having to necessarily be consciously aware of that. So the classic reflex arc is the patellar tendon reflex. And so what you can see depicted here is, and you know, this happens when you go to the doctor's office sometimes, if you go for a general physical, they'll do patellar tendon reflex. And so when they hit your patellar tendon, just below your kneecap, with the reflex hammer, what happens is that patellar tendon, remember that it's attached to the quad tendon or the quadriceps muscle group. And so when we tap on the, the tendon down here, that's gonna rapidly stretch the quadriceps group. Just a little bit, it's not a big stretch, but it's just a, a, an unexpected rapid stretch of that quad group. So then the fact that those quad muscles are stretching really quickly is relayed back up to the spinal cord, again, going in that uh, dorsal root through the dorsal horn. And then that information, basically, hey, this muscle is being stretched too fast, is transmitted via an interneuron to an alpha motor neuron, which then causes an output, causing the muscle to contract. So what muscle spindles do is if a muscle is stretched too fast, they'll cause it to reflexively contract, basically to keep it from being overstretched. Now that said, muscle spindles are more than protective mechanisms. So we use them like as part of the normal gait cycle. So gait means walking or running. So when uh, you stride forward, when you step out, you'll reach a certain amount of uh, distension or stretching of the hamstrings and then that will stimulate the muscle spindles. Basically, we've, we've stretched them enough, and then you get reflex contraction of the hamstring group, which then causes you to extend at the hip and then propel yourself into the next step. So a lot of the basic things that we do are this combination of reflex responses from muscle spindles. All right, the muscle stretched enough, then we get reflex contraction. And we get the same kind of thing like during a baseball pitch when you go into the, the full windup as you fully externally rotate at the shoulder, you're gonna get a stretching of uh, pec major, lats, et cetera, some of those internal rotators. Once you've reached full or sufficient stretching, once you've gone as far as you can in external rotation, it stimulates that reflex contraction, which then allows you to, to uh, accelerate into internal rotation that much more quickly. So we use reflex arcs during lots and lots of activities, ranging from um, walking to running or jumping or throwing, reflex arcs are involved in all of that. And similarly, when we get to talking about um, breathing, so breathing works on a, on a very similar mechanism. If, if you're just at rest, you have stretch receptors in the uh, bronchioles, you have stretch receptors in the diaphragm, and so once those are stretched or not, then that can either uh, cause relaxation or it can cause you to contract the diaphragm and to breathe in. And so stretch receptors play a really important role in respiration as well. All right, and then my last thing is the concept of proprioception. So again, proprioception is, is position sense. And so we've talked about this idea of once a sprain, always a sprain. So what you're looking at there is the lateral view of the right ankle. And so if you sprain your right ankle, as we'll talk about in, in the lab video, so you've got three primary lateral ankle ligaments. The first one's here, the anterior talofibular, got the calcaneofibular here, and then the posterior talofibular here. So for the most part, when you roll your ankle or when you sprain it, get a classic lateral ankle sprain. It's typically an injur injury to the anterior talofibular here, and occasionally, if you get a really bad one, um, to the calcaneofibular. But effectively, one of the things we've talked about is most of the people in the class who've sprained their ankle have done it more than once. And so the question then is, well, why does that happen? Well, we've talked about previously that once you stretch a ligament out, it stays stretched out. So after I sprain my ankle and stretch out this ATFL, it stays stretched. And so now that ankle joint is just a little bit less stable than it was before because you've stretched out one of the ligaments that limits its range of motion. So the ankle, that joint moves around more than it used to. It's, it has some, it's referred to as laxity, it has some extra movement to it. So that's one part of it. But another part of it is that when you sprain your ankle, when you do a classic inversion mechanism, which is where, you know, again, you most people refer to it as rolling their ankle, but effectively what happens is that the bottom of your foot faces toward the midline. And so when you do that, you have primarily these two muscles here, which are peroneus brevis right there, and then peroneus longus right there, those muscles do the opposite action. So if the ankle is injured by going into inversion, where the bottom of the foot faces the midline, those two muscles are everters. They bring the bottom of the foot away from the midline. 
So if you go like step on a step off of a curb and you sort of hit it wrong and you start to roll your ankle, you're going to get a reflex contraction of those two muscles because the muscle spindles in them will say, hey, we're being overstretched or being stretched too quickly. So they'll send that uh, signal back to the spinal cord, which will cause a reflex contraction of those two muscles of peroneus longus and brevis. They'll contract and then you get eversion of the foot and it'll help you help hopefully put you back in a good position before you actually damage any of the ligaments. So um, what ends up happening though, if you actually sprain your ankle is you have damaged some of those receptors in the ligament. So for example, we talked about the Meissner's and Pacinian corpuscles. So those don't send signals back to the brain anymore. You've damaged the receptors in the actual joint capsule. So those don't send signals back to the brain anymore. So after that injury, you're just less aware of where the ankle is in space because you've lost some of that proprioception coming from those uh, Pacinian corpuscles and the Ruffini endings. Um, so that's part of the equation. But then the other part of the equation is if you've actually stretched the ankle out and, and damaged that tissue, you've also then overstretched the perineal muscles, which would be here. So again, these are their two tendons. The muscle bellies would be up here, kind of uh, along the fibula. So you've also overstretched those muscles, so then you've damaged their muscle spindles. So with that, not only is the ankle less stable, you're getting less feedback about where it is in space, but you're also less able to contract the muscles that would fix bad positioning, that would, that would fix it as it rolls into inversion. So basically you can't correct a bad position. So it's this combination of the reason, once you sprain your ankle once, the reason you're more likely to do it again is that the ankle is looser or more lax. Um, you're less aware of where it is in space. And then once you put it into a bad position, you're less able to correct that position. So it's kind of the combination of those three things. Where I've got my ankle taping and kinesio tape. So one of the reasons that ankle taping helps prevent recurrence of ankle injuries and, and same kind of thing with kinesio tape. Um, what those do, if you place tape on the skin and if you compress the, the, the skin around the joint, what those do then is give extra feedback from the receptors in the skin. So as mentioned, you've got uh, numerous receptors in the skin, including things like Meissner's corpuscles, and you also have Pacinian corpuscles and Ruffini endings there as well. So now you're getting extra feedback from the skin receptors that will hopefully offset the feedback you're not getting from the receptors in the joint capsule and then the ligaments. So that's kind of one of the ideas behind angle taping and behind kinesio tape or KT tape or rock tape or whatever you want to call it. That's the idea behind those. So for example, if you watch, um, I think it's Katie Walsh, Carrie Walsh, some volleyball player. Sorry to be so dismissive. Uh, one of the professional women beach volleyball players um, always has like KT tape or kinesio tape on her shoulder. And so the idea of that tape, same idea. If you compress the skin a little bit, you're going to get more um, more feedback, and so you're, you're less likely to put that shoulder in a bad position, so hopefully you're less likely to get injured. Where I've got plyometric training on there, so plyometric training is if you've got a rapid stretch of the muscle followed by rapid contraction. So the classic example of plyometric training is box jumps. So if you jump onto a box and then you uh, jump off of it and jump onto another one really quickly, what you're doing when you jump off of the first one and hit the ground is you're getting a rapid stretch of the quad muscles or the hamstrings of the plantar flexors, etc. And so if you get a rapid stretch of the muscle, that's going to trigger that uh, muscle spindle reflex, which then you get a reflex contraction. Plus, if you're intentionally contracting the quads, the hamstrings, etc., because you intend to jump onto the next box, you also get voluntary muscle contraction. And so you just get a, a bigger, stronger muscle contraction if you get a rapid stretch first, because effectively you get that involuntary reflexive contraction plus the voluntary contraction that you were intending to get. All right, so that was a pretty long one. Uh, let's see if we go up here. So we're at a little over an hour. Sorry for the length, but normally this would have been at least a two-day uh, version of all of this stuff. So this is kind of two lectures in one, and the remainder of them will probably be pretty similar. So the next thing we've got is the endocrine system, and that should be, pretty sure, I don't have the syllabus in front of me, but that should be the last uh, lecture before the second test. So good luck. Email me if you have any questions, and we'll see you when we get to the endocrine system.